I think that I, my presentation just overloaded the whole system. I brought it all down. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got some, some uh, visuals on some self-refuting arguments that I bet are going to pop up in a second. Um, so I like, I like these. All right. All right, so um, in the top left there, you, we've got a stone. And what's written on the stone? <laughs> Nothing is written in stone. I mean, uh, that clearly is not true, it could, because there it is saying, here's something written in stone. Here's a guy sitting on a tree limb, and he's cutting it off. Um, if he succeeds in that, um, he's going to be in trouble. And I like this one, things that I hate. One, vandalism. Two, irony. Three, lists. Um, <laughs> in the very act of doing those things, he's like contradicted all of those at once. In a way, um, naturalism is a worldview when taken to its logical ends does exactly what you see going on in these pictures. It boldly says, reason tells me that there is no such thing as reason. That, you know, this ability to, to be able to draw conclusions from premises based on r rational principles is something that nobody can do. And let me give you the five reasons I believe that. That it just doesn't work. It's an idea that includes its own refutation as one of its own logical entailments. Uh, the, the argument from reason has a long history. Um, I picked it up in the middle bullet point there from C.S. Lewis originally. Um, and then as I've delved a little bit more into this, I found that there was a lot more to it. Well, I got this still going at least. Um, so um, a long, long time ago, Socrates, uh, he gave in, in uh, his apology, uh, his defense before uh, uh, the people of Athens as part of his trial, an argument for the existence of, uh, of God based on the fact that he had a mind. He says, well, you know, one reason I know that I, that, because he was accused of being an atheist, and he said, well, how can I be an atheist if I believe that I have a mind, and I believe minds have to come from a greater mind? Um, one of the first arguments from reason came out from him. Rene Descartes has a, an argument in the third meditation saying, there are things my mind grasps, um, concepts that cannot be explained by anything within myself, anything I've observed. It has to be, the only way I could have these thoughts is if there is a God who, uh, who put those thoughts there. John Locke, for all of his empiricism, kind of has this argument um, for God that doesn't seem very empirical that suggests, once again, this same idea that we, that there must be a God, there's no gr other way to explain how we are able to reason and think. Um, more recently, uh, Victor Reppert had this book that was, a, that was a pretty big splash in 2003 called C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea. Really great book, not a very long read either. If you're looking for a place to get into it, to it I would recommend that. Um, and I actually think that we're seeing an age where this argument is being discussed a lot more in fact, uh, does anyone in here subscribe to Philosophia Christi? Anyone have access to Philosophia Christi? Familiar with that? It's a journal um, that is produced by the Evangelical Philosophical Society. In the current issue, there is an article on the argument from reason. So there are, um, there's really a lot of, of discussion that's been generated by this. I think that we're seeing uh, this continue to grow and for people to be talking about it. So what is the argument, right? I'm giving you a lot of background here, but what is the argument? Well, let's start with what is reason, because this is the starting point. Sometimes we use the word reason in different ways. So when we talk about the argument from reason, we need to first get clear on this. And I think of reason as the act of reasoning, that reason is the, if you want to put it this way, the intentional application of logic. The making of inferential connections from one idea and drawing what follows from that. Um, philosophers and logicians will refer to, the, to this, to what you're grasping, to what you're seeing, to what you are 
um, drawing in these logical inferences, in, in these acts of rationality as grasping validity or entailment. Um, it, it's that eureka moment, that aha that we can have when we're putting, to, when we're assembling thought. All right, so now it's time for a quiz. Audience participation time. Here you go. You are, I'm asking you what logically follows. So one claim, all men are mortal. Second claim, Socrates is a man. Therefore, all right, Socrates is mortal. Good, good job, guys. All of you knew the answer to that, even though, let me also take another quick poll. How many of you have had a formal logic class? Oh, maybe a few more hands than, than I expect. All right. Still, I bet a lot of, I bet y'all who did not have a formal logic class could still see that. You, we are able to do this. Here's the next question. How did you know the answer? Now, this is, let me tell you first how you did not know the answer. You did not know this answer based on experimental trial and error. It was not a matter of you having tried out enough different logical argument forms over time and finding out this one works, that one doesn't work, and gosh, this one is sure getting a lot of right answers, and that one keeps. That's not how we, you, you could know the answer to this even if you had never tried out a logical argument before in your life, that you just see what follows. Um, one of the reasons why the, it's not trial and error is partly because valid and invalid arguments don't always give, invalid arguments don't always give you false conclusions, and valid arguments don't always give you true conclusions. That uh, validity is a function of what would follow if they were true. And so um, even what I tell my logic students, I give them this argument, I'll say, um, here's, and so I always preface it with, here's an argument with false premises. Um, all women are bad drivers. John DePoe is a woman. Therefore, John DePoe is a bad driver. Notice that you could draw that inference even though it's a false conclusion, I promise. But also, <laughs> the premises are false. It doesn't, you're not figuring these arguments out. You don't grasp reason based on its success. You're grasping it on some other level. Another reason is that the whole idea of trial and error, of inductive inferences that are based on, you know, on what we, the things we do discover through trial and error actually depend on logical arguments and principles of reasoning. So you couldn't have discovered them that way because then you'd have to discover them before you discover them. And since that's impossible, it must have been the case they were there first. So um, the primacy of our ability to reason Pre, it, it has to come before our ability to engage in experimental reasoning. Um, how do we know it? Well, I would say it's a primary act or a primary power of the mind. It's something that we can grasp firsthand. It's something that we are aware of from uh, the, our own, it's just a, a basic ability we possess. Uh, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. When he's talking about reason, he says, it is not an object that knocks against us, nor even a sensation which we feel. Reasoning doesn't happen to us. We do it. We understand, I would say we understand reasoning much like we understand free will. It's something that we, we know what free will is, even if you have a hard time defining it, even if you have a hard time uh, explaining it, you know that what it is because you do it. Reason is the same way, that sometimes we have a hard time explaining something like this, but we know what it is because we do it firsthand. Likewise, um, Augustine has a quote like this about the nature of time, that we know what time is because we experience it, but when you try to explain it, all of a sudden you're, you're unable to, to understand that. Um, reason is, is one of those primary concepts that's very close to who we are. It's a very fundamental thing about us. So one more distinction when we think about reasoning. Um, sometimes this, this, I, I have this discussion with people and they'll ask you, well, why are you a Christian? I sit down and talk with my friends who aren't Christians. They'll ask, why are you a Christian? And I, I say there's actually two ways I can explain this to you. I can tell you this, my sort of biography. You know, I was raised by these kinds of parents and 
you know, then I had these events take place, and then that happened, and then I became a Christian. Or I can give you a different kind of story about the reasons that I possess that underwrite um, why I continue to be a Christian, why I hold on to that faith. It's very similar to this distinction. That it, we're trying to talk about why is grandpa ill? And you could answer this in one of two ways. You could say, A, grandpa is ill today because he ate lobster yesterday. Or B, you might say grandpa must be ill today because he hasn't gotten up yet. The first one is an example of a cause and effect. It's a, it's a way of using because in a cause and effect way. Cause and effect is how we might relate to physical events or objects, um, how we explain how they interact with one another. And that, um, so in the first one we say grandpa is ill today because he ate lobster yesterday. It's just giving you the cause, or what we believe to be the cause of the illness. In the second one, it is an example of what Lewis calls ground and consequent. Um, it's this idea of being a reason to believe. Notice in the first one, we're not saying, I have a reason to believe he's ill today because he ate lobster yesterday. It's just kind of stating the, the causal connections. In the second one, it's giving us a reason to believe he's ill. I am, I be, it's like saying, I believe grandpa's ill today because this is my reason. He hasn't gotten up yet. And some probably other background beliefs, right? That he's normally up by now, and there's no reason for him not to be up by now otherwise, and so on. So um, with these two things in mind, let's take a look now at naturalism. Um, when we, I should also just stress one other thing is that when we talk about reasoning, when we're talking about rationality, we're not talking about A. We're talking about B. We're talking about the ability to connect ideas and to see the logical consequences that follow from certain grounds. We're not just saying this follows from that in terms of cause and effect. So naturalism, where does the human capacity for reason come from according to naturalism? Well, it's a purposeless worldview. It's a worldview that says that everything operates at, at the microphysical or the physical level according to laws without any respect to goals, purposes, ends. So it's just a matter of time, chance, and evolution. So if you were to say, what are the goals of evolution, I'd say, well, first of all, it has no goals. But if you really wanted to sort of put goals in scare quotes and say, like, what sorts of things does naturalism produce, I would say that in that sense, it would select, and I put that in scare quotes because it selecting implies a kind of intentional choosing. It doesn't do that, of course. Uh, but it selects four factors that enhance the survival and the spread of an organism's genes. The capacity for acquiring logical reasoning would at least be an unintended side effect of the evolutionary naturalistic processes. So um, the capacity for reasoning um, is not something you would expect given naturalism. It's not something that is likely to be there. You might say, well, that's easy for you to say as a Christian. Um, but actually, naturalists themselves say this. So in a passage that has become known as Darwin's Doubt, uh, Charles Darwin, in a letter to a friend, actually was concerned about this very issue. He's, he writes, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Notice that, any value all trustworthy. Not like, oh, maybe we might make some higher level mistakes. He's worried about the whole, our whole ability to reason. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are convictions in such a mind? So I, one of the, the concerns is that, and Darwin himself sees this, which is how can we trust our ability to reason on the naturalist program? If naturalism is true, and our brains are the, the products of just blind operations in nature with no end purpose or goal or design to them, why trust our ability to reason? Uh, more recently, um, a, an epistemologist uh, who was writing a paper on a kind of evolutionary epistemology, who, uh, this is Patricia Churchland, 
She um, is an, a, a thoroughgoing, I would say a very consistent atheist and materialist. This is what she says about what you should expect about evolution and truth in terms of our epistemic abilities to get at truth. She says, boiled down to essentials, a nervous system enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. Uh, figure that one out later. If you don't know, there's language I don't want to teach you. Um, the principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they need to be in order that the organism may survive. Improvements in sensory motor control confer an evolutionary advantage. A fancier style of representing is advantageous so long as it is geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chances of survival. And here's the money quote, truth whatever it is, takes the hindmost. In other words, if we are the products of naturalistic evolutionary forces, then we have been produced by a process that puts a premium on survival and gene spreading. But we have not been produced by any kind of process that we should expect to help us get to know truth. truth the acquisition of truth actually is not really all, always that helpful in terms of survival or spreading of genes. You can have all kinds of false beliefs and still survive and spread your genes. In fact, um, I'm not really sure how intelligent a lot of other animals are, and yet they're quite capable at surviving without any um, or very many uh, true beliefs, if they have any at all. So um, she recognizes that kind of the cold hard truth about evolutionary naturalism, which is, yeah, for the products of, of that, we probably shouldn't expect. Uh, we have no reason to think that our, that our minds have been engineered in a way to give us true beliefs. So naturalism tells us that it's not reasonable. Um, it's, it, it actually entails that it's not re reasonable, reasonable to believe that naturalism itself is true. So coming back to Lewis's distinction, naturalism is a, is a is a worldview that says everything is governed by cause and effect. One thing knocking into another, operating on another thing that just leads to the next thing. And that leads to the next thing, and that leads to the next thing. But all of those causal processes are not rational. They're not ground and consequent. In order for us to have rational grounds for believing something, it would have to be the, the product of ground and consequent reasoning. So all thoughts on naturalism are nothing more than the causal effects of the brain in response to the laws of physics, those prior conditions, and environmental stimuli. That's it. Nothing more to it. Um, let me walk you through, through this. What I'm thinking here is this is what a naturalist would have to say about our little exercise we did earlier about all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. So here you are in that first moment when I asked you to consider those two claims. Let's call that brain state one. And according to the naturalist, that is the cause of the mental state. When I put the little slide up there, there were stimuli, the environment was just right, and it caused you to have the thought, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. Then according to naturalism, that leads to the next brain state. When I say compute. You know, what is the logical consequence? And that causes you now to have this next thought. Socrates is mortal. But you'll notice that what is missing here, we have one brain state causing one thought, and then that brain state causing the next brain state, which causes the next thought. But there is no relation of ground and consequent here. All it is is conditioning. All it is is environment. All it is is one set of causes producing a second set of causes. But where is reason in all of this? Where is that logical drawing of inference from one thing to the next? There's no room for it in naturalism. There's no way to talk about the, if the, the ground and consequent relation moving from one mental state to the next. So this is what's missing on the naturalist worldview. The naturalistic worldview has to explain everything in terms of cause and effect and ground and consequent, that rational relationship that holds between things, well, it goes to the wayside. There's no, there's no place for that. Um, 
Suppose you were on a search and rescue mission. I want to give you a couple of analogies that I think are really helpful that you can take with you. Because sometimes we go to these kinds of apologetic conferences and we hear from speakers and we, we take notes and, and what we take away is very, very academic. And then you go to your coworker or your family member or that friend and you're trying to explain things and you're, you just realize, I can't even begin talking about this because I'd have to spend a, like an hour of just giving them vocabulary and so on. Let me see if I can give you an analogy you can take with you to the workplace. Suppose you're on a search and rescue mission and there's somebody that's been missing and so you get up in a helicopter and you're looking around for the person and you see this pattern of stones. Suppose you were to say, hey, let's put the chopper down or let's look more closely over here. I think that, you know, that our, the missing person wrote this message. What if the pilot or the person you're working with says, you know, given enough time and chance, stones were, supposed to, were eventually supposed to be, stones would eventually end up in that configuration somewhere, right? And you might think that's a really bad inference to draw, but then he says, and let's go ahead and put the chopper down because that's where the person will be. You can't have it both ways. It can't be an accident and give you a message. This is what the naturalist wants. The naturalist is trying to say your minds are the products of accident, but you can still trust the deliverances of that as if it's this robust reasoning. You can't have it both ways. Either it's an accident with no meaning and no purpose behind it, or it is a design thing that was not the product of blind forces, but not both. Let me give you another example. This one's from a philosopher named Peter Kreft. Um, he says, any of y'all know what punch cards are for computers? A few of you. My, my, both of my parents are computer programmers, or were. They're retired now. They programmed computers with these punch cards. These were like these giant computers that like filled this whole room, and they would have less processing power than this thing does. Um, but the way you would program them was you'd take these punch cards. They were just like these um, little plastic cards with little holes on them. And you'd punt, you know, run them in in a certain sequence, and that would tell the computer to do certain things. Well, imagine um, we're going to take all these punch cards. We're just going to throw them across a football field. We're going to have the football team march over them at random. And then we're going to collect all the punch cards, shuffle them up. You know, the football players in their cleats punched holes in them randomly. And we're going to feed this into a computer to program the autopilot landing sequence of an airplane. How many of you want to be in that airplane? I certainly don't. Um, then the chances of that airplane doing anything meaningful, let alone landing, um, are, are pretty much slim to none. Well, this is exactly what the naturalist is saying about our minds, that our minds have been programmed by random, unintentional, accidental causes not geared towards reason but we should still trust our minds to tell us that naturalism is true. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that your minds are, are accidental products without any goal orientation towards truth, and furthermore, they tell us what's true. Um, you if you're a naturalist, you, you provide all the basis you need to say that I shouldn't believe naturalism itself is true. And C.S. Lewis says this better than I do, so maybe I should just go ahead and move to him. Lewis says, if naturalism were true, then all thoughts, whatever, would be wholly the result of irrational causes. Therefore, all thoughts would be equally worthless. Therefore, naturalism is worthless. If it is true, then we can know no truths. It cuts its own throat. And so, I would try to encourage you, if you get into one of these arguments with an atheist or a friend um, that wants to try to take some kind of route that, of a worldview that is devoid of a personal God as our origin of the source of where we come from, to focus in on that word reason or rationality or logic that they want to use and to turn it on its head and say, let's talk about that. Um, Here's the argument as I would put this into a logical form. So if you're looking, for those of you that are looking for something a little more academic, here's how I would summarize the argument. 
first two premises say that naturalism essentially excludes the possibility for beliefs to stand in gra ground and consequent relations. Everything is just the product of cause and effect. Secondly, a necessary condition for beliefs to be rationally justified is for them to be able to stand in ground and consequent relations. Therefore, naturalism cannot satisfy a condition for rationally justified beliefs. Well, any worldview that, that excludes rationally justified beliefs is itself so is self-defeating. Therefore, naturalism is self-defeating. So um, I think that this is, uh, this is intellectually what is, what is going on behind this argument, that this is how you're going to get uh, from the claims of naturalism being this mindless, unintended, accidental connection of, of physical events to this idea that it is self-defeating, that it just there's not enough room in the worldview there to tell you, um, to, to give you everything that it needs, to give you everything that it uses. Um, so in sum, this is what I would say. If we are able to engage in reasoning, then naturalism cannot be true. It basically hangs all its hopes on a, an, on a coincidence. It's like that SOS message. It's like saying, yeah, there's no reason to expect our minds to be programmed for truth, but let's just trust it anyway. There's no reason to think the SOS pattern is from a person, but let's put the chopper down anyway, because we're just hoping it's a nice coincidence. Um, that's, just not, that, that's just not sound thinking. What we should draw instead by looking at our ability to reason is that there must be something that exists beyond nature that is the source of rationality. And the best explanation for that is a mind who has created humans in his own rational nature. That, our, that at, at the, source of, the fundamental source of reality can't be something small like matter and laws, but something big a mind that itself contains reason, that a mind, uh, uh, an, an, an internal and infinite mind that um, is the source of, of all things. That actually does fit with what, with what uh, we find in the world. So um, we've got a little bit of time here. Um, if, or we can, run off to, we can run off to lunch quickly. But, um, Questions, comments, discussions, maybe jokes or insults. Um, I'm open to whatever. So um, I can tell you some other interesting things. If, for instance, some of you are familiar with uh, Plantinga on this. I could tell you why I think Plantinga is wrong on this particular issue. Um, that would be a little controversial. But uh, anyway, uh, thoughts on, on this or is there anything I can follow up with? I'll start in the front and I'll make my way back. But I've got a leading question then to that. Okay. Yeah. That's right. I think so. Let's go straight to that. Um, <laughs> so there's a there's a, a classical way of thinking about epistemology, which is this view that says that we need to, to know in order to know things, we either know it inferentially, meaning we draw it from other be, other beliefs we know in a logically sound way, or non-inferentially, um, things that we grasp immediately, whether that's because it's self-evident or innate knowledge or through direct acquaintance. There's a lot of different views about that. Um, but then there's a, another kind of view. So that's, that's more of the camp I'm in, where I want to say that all knowledge springs from our ability to grasp truth in this ground and consequent way. There are other approaches out there. And those of you that have taken epistemology courses, these are called externalist views of justification. If you don't remember that, that's fine for everyone else. The idea behind these is that knowledge or justified beliefs are produced by the right kind of causal sequences, by reliable causal processes, that a belief is justified when the process that produced it is highly reliable. Planning is not quite a reliableist. He's what's called a proper functionalist. It's pretty close to that, though. And he, and he just has a sl slightly different criteria. But the point for someone like Plantinga and for many others who would deny the, the claim I have there is to say justified beliefs or knowledge take place when the causal connections produce in your mind true beliefs under the right conditions. 
I just don't think that's what's happening. In, in, I wouldn't call that rational. To me, that's just more cause and effect. That's just like atoms bumping against one another. I think substituting a Christian naturalistic view of epistemology for a secular one, which is what I would say I think Plantinga is doing. A, a secular cause and effect can't be displaced with simply a Christian cause and effect story. I think that rationality is a, of a different category than cause and effect. And so I would say that even though many people think Plantinga's views are actually kind of like the ancestor of Lewis's, and Plantinga himself claims that, um, I think that's just mistaken. Um, and I, I, so uh, this is built out of a lot of conviction I have. If you're very interested in this, I have an article in the Christian Scholars Review that is all about just this issue. Um, and, you can, and I've got a website with it for free if you're interested in that. Um, so I'll go to the next question. We can come back to this if there's more on, on that, or maybe we're all happy to move to something else. I think that we can see that one, tr having true beliefs is really not important to survival at all. In fact, sometimes even having false beliefs is really important for you to spread, for you to survive and, and spread your genes. That the, doesn't it seem like the guy who gets the girl a lot of times is not thinking straight? Uh, that it's helpful, it, it's useful for him to be thinking that he's better than he actually is, for him to uh, not see reality for the way it is. Uh, I think that in a lot of cases, um, truth really doesn't help you. Another way to think about this, this is the way Plantinga, and what I would say that is good about Plantinga is I think he's right about saying what's wrong with naturalism. Um, I, think he's, I think Plantinga just gets it wrong in saying what's right, here's the right view. But I think he's, he's completely right in what he says with what's wrong with naturalism. So. A, you know, a primitive human being, and so taking the naturalist story, somebody, and a sort of proto-human that's on the evolutionary scale coming up, um, he would survive if he saw, thought a tiger was a tiger. But he could also survive if he thought that the tiger, um, if he thought that, um, you know, a tiger was a different kind of threat to his life. Or if he thought that a boulder, also a, a boulder that looked like a tiger was a tiger. You don't have to have true beliefs to survive. And another corollary to this is even if you could talk about some very basic true beliefs that you need to survive, higher level reasoning that we're capable of doing certainly has very little survival value. The ability to do truth tables, to do um, logical syllogisms, the ability to perform mathematical operations at the level of calculus, these things have almost no survival value. So the fact that we would have any of those abilities, once again, and you can't really build those, once again, out of trial and error and cause and effect. So even if we're willing to grant the naturalist a little bit of true beliefs, which I'm still hesitant to do, you can't give, get the whole story of human rationality out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my brain has not evolved to really appreciate what Planting has to say about this. I'm yeah. Just kidding. I wanted to cover judgmental real quick. Okay, good, good. lines of if a rational mind is a rational mind, then what does it matter how it came about? Like, why wouldn't we expect a product of reality to track with it? So I'm kind of maybe devil's advocating a little bit here. So this. Um, so putting aside the probability of, you know, the football player stomping out the right code for an airplane, uh, so the probabilistic fine tuning side of it, putting that aside, you know, if naturalism, if evolutionary processes are capable of producing a higher mind, because it is a product of a real world, why wouldn't we expect it to track with that real world? Why wouldn't we expect the eyes that have come with it to see things as they really are, ears to hear things as they really are, and the brain to actually process this data as it really is? Like it seems like that would be most advantageous of all. Uh, you know, you talk about why do we have to see the tiger as a tiger? Well, tiger has certain properties that boulders don't have. Like if both are coming at you, running from it's good, but you know, there's certain things about a tiger, like I can maybe stab a tiger with a sharp pointy object, it's not gonna work against a boulder. Like, so tracking with reality seems to be 
perhaps produce the highest degree of survivability. And perhaps other things like, you know, it starts with, you know, apes can use rocks to open, like hard ends, like coconuts or something like that. What starts as just basic reason for survival may generate the byproduct of higher level abstract thinking, which leads to everything else. So, like, why wouldn't we expect yeah, something like that? Part of it is also that that's always there's for every the one there's for a true description of reality there are infinitely many false ways to describe that same reality that instead of thinking of you know tigers and boulders as these natural objects you could think of them as supernatural objects as like other kinds of entities um, you could think of. Uh, I think that even in part of the way that you're talking about, you kind of assume like in the very like stabbing of a tire versus the stabbing of a rock, we kn you would know the difference between the two. Why, your mind, for all we know, may not distinguish between those kinds of actions. The, it's not, here's the, the way I would put this is that it's not that it's impossible for naturalism to give us faculties and, and a mind that's oriented towards truth. It's that it wouldn't be expected. Um, I wouldn't, in the end, want to tell a naturalist, and I don't think any naturalist would, would draw from this, well, I guess I really should just stop trusting my mind and stop uh, drawing true conclusions. The point is the fact that we do draw these types of conclusions, that we do think in these ways, is evidence of something greater. Um, when I think about, uh, and one other point I want to try to suppose you're right that maybe at the most basic object level, of reality, we would get true beliefs on an evolutionary view. Okay, suppose I grant that. I still, you, you still cannot, it, the, you kind of have this magical leap, and from there we could get everything else. I don't think that's really doable. I don't think that you can just simply get from very simple truths to being able to extrapolate um, the abilities to reason that we have. Once again, if you think about logic, our ability to draw valid inferences, that's not based on a, a kind of inductive inference. It couldn't be because inductive inference itself is a kind of form of reasoning you'd have to learn. So you can't learn or develop this reasoning. It's either there or it's not. Um, but I would even question, like you said, some of the most basic object level beliefs are those, is that even ra being rational in the sense I'm talking about it? Um, there's a lot more to be said about, about this, but that would be kind of a, a first pass to think about how, to, how, to, how I would develop some of that. Maybe another question or two? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that it's an interesting thing to, to think about in this age where we're seeing a decline in faith, especially young, among young people, that this is one of the a generation of people that have been raised not to think logically or to see arguments, but are, you know, mo mo more often than not influenced through social media, through, you know, just the, the flurry. And in a lot of ways, that's just cause and effect. Being, it, that's the way propaganda works. C.S. Lewis talks about this, that Examples of cause and effect influences on our thought are more like racism and propaganda and these sorts of things where they try to use cause and effect to influence how you think. And the way to rise above that is to reclaim ground and consequent, to be able to, to think again, to apply logic. Well, I think that that's a lot of what I'm seeing with young people today is that they're being, they've lost the ability to think. Um, or they're losing it, or it's become blurred, or it's become fuzzy. And I think that as Christians, we should be thinking more about how we educate our children, and whether it's about looking for alternative schools, or homeschooling, or youth ministry, whatever it is, I think a component of that needs to be, at an appropriate age level, teaching them how to think, um, how to apply the ability to reason, and uh, to stir that up in them. That, for me, when I was in about, uh, sixth grade, 
my youth minister presented the ontological argument for the existence of God, and it blew my mind. And from that point on, I could not turn it off. Um, that, for me, sparked a fire that would forever cause me to, to realize that, re that I can use reason to think about my faith. Now, maybe a sad side of that story. Now, I don't actually find the ontological argument convincing anymore, but the point was that he showed me with re that he got me thinking. And that's what I would encourage people to, one thing to take away from this too is that uh, in the end, I think logic and reason are ultimately the, the tools of God and that the devil would not, would, couldn't be happier than, he, he doesn't want disinformation, he doesn't want to bad arguments, he would, he would just rather people not think at all. That we just lull ourselves into a comfortable place where we're just entertained and Sadly, I think that's what happens a lot and what we're trying to do in our youth ministries a lot now is we're trying to out-entertain the world and we think we're going to keep them in the faith that way. And one thing, the world is way better than us at being entertaining, I think. Um, and what we need to do is to, hold, to get them to see the truth, to love the truth, and to find uh, you know, truth, goodness, and beauty as, a play, as, as things that we are devoted to and that we, we love and seek out. And I think if we can do that, um, that's... That's my vision for holding on to the next uh, generation. Last comments, or are we just hungry? Well, thank you all. I uh, enjoyed it, and I uh, hope you were able to take some of this home with you.